choices about what types of menu items they want, what types of menu items they don't want. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was very, it was very, um, I think, I don't know if she's here, but I think Ms. Olivo for um, bringing that to attention. And I, and I really enjoyed um, visiting your school and meeting those students. So we need a motion for passage. Motion approved by Ms. Bonolo, seconded by Ms. Grant. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. All, right. All those opposed? Okay. Great work on that one, Ms. Doobie. New business, first one. Uh, I need a motion for approval for a middle school cheerleading club. Do I have a motion for approval of the chair middle school cheerleading club? Second. Moved by Ms. Doobie, seconded by Ms. Grant. Discussion? Uh, Coach, are you here to Talk about coach, go ahead. Athletic director, sorry, AD. Good evening, everyone. Are there any questions about what they talk about for us? Yes, please. Okay, so right now, what we'd like to um, ask the mission for us to co op our three middle schools uh, to do club cheerleading. There will be four competitions, the state meet, the athletic college, um, do the whole practices at Slater Middle School, <coughs> next week with our high school. We co op right now with our high school cheerleading squad. Uh, three coaches from a high school level with our one volunteer would be our coaches right now. We have um, price uniforms, they wouldn't be anything too crazy expensive wise. Uh, we price the cheapest round would be $100. But right now, our girls are uh, fundraising for it. So, hopefully, that we're going to fundraise enough money that we have to ask our school um, to pay from our school budget. It is a co op, so we will be taking all of our girls that to try out. We wouldn't cut anybody. Um, during the meet, though, because it's a uh, competitive, you know, club is competitive, there's only 20 to 25 girls allowed during each competition. That's just a, a rule that they make for competition cheerleading at the high school and middle school level. So that's kind of how it's going to work the first year, and then we'll take a look at it. If there's enough young ladies that are competing in each middle school, then we can hold it separately each middle school. Then at that point, you know, we would probably ask for coaches at each middle school if that is approved. And under that, um, sorry, under that, as we know, our middle school sports, we have coaches, we have a coach and assistants that make uh, fifteen hundred dollars for a cycle, and a thousand dollars for a cycle. That's the middle school. Level. Okay, Ms. Benoit. Um, question: You said young ladies. Isn't cheerleading open? It, it be open. Yes, I apologize for that. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Grant? Um, you mentioned that the high school could be for right now. Did you guys post the, are you going to post the position if it gets approved tonight? As, as far as coaches? No, right now what we'd like to do is have a high school coach run it. Um, because of the fact that at Slate we have the two gyms, so they would run it from 5 to 7.30 and they're going to run the middle school program. When you say they, they're going to run the middle school program this, this season. Right, but they run the high school program, correct? So, yes, yeah, so they, they practice at the same time from 5 to 7 30, but there's two gyms, so they're going to work it, you know, like an hour for middle school, then the high school after that, and that's 12, two and a half hours. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? No. This way, the financial, uh, is there a financial to this, just the uniforms? Right, and right, right now, we, um, we are going to fundraise if it's, if it's okay. We're going to fundraise and we'll see where we are financially to purchase. We have to purchase uniforms and we have to do that. All right, so with that, uh, any other questions? Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Benora. Yes. Ms. Carney. Yes. Mr. Chauvin. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. Ms. Fernandez. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Shalel. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next item is recall of certified educators. Assistant Superintendent. Good evening. Mm -hmm. We have one recall this evening where we'd like to recall Taylor Keys to Baldwin Elementary, Grade 1, MLL, for a one year position. Second. Oh, seconded by Ms. Grant. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Thank you. Next item is uh, approval of E-rate scope of work to E-plus. Hirsch, thank you. Good evening, everyone. 
the uh, the request that I have in front of you is every um, few years we're able to take advantage of E-rate funds to upgrade our network. And uh, last year we we sent out our proposals. Uh, E-rate is very specific as far as the whole uh, proposal the way it has to go out and what we need to um, rate them and score them and everything. So this all went out and E plus was the um, the bid that was um, that we accepted. Uh, what this means is that we put in our budget for our E rate. We pay 20% of the cost of the, the work. Uh, it's changed. We used to pay 10%, uh, but now we pay 20% because of our change in free and reduced lunch. Uh, but this, what this is in front of you is uh, we've sent it through legal. It's been vetted as to replace network switches and um, access points throughout the district. Our share is 49,274. And the uh, USAC um, pays $396,243.74. Motion by Ms. Benoit, seconded by Mr. Chabonneau. Discussion. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Benoit, yeah. Ms. Carney, yeah. Mr. Chabonneau, yeah. Ms. Doobie, Ms. Fernandez, yeah. Ms. Grant, yeah. Mr. Shalow. Yes, thank you. First, thank you. Thank you. Next item. Is going to be um, Collier's. Yes, please. I was going to ask you, do you mind just coming up to the first one, though, is recommendation to award an ADA bathroom renovation project general contractor. Thank you. Um, the recommendation to award in front of you is for Marin Construction for the ADA bathroom upgrade project uh, as a general contractor services um, for the four schools uh, Curtis Elementary, Kerbin McCabe Elementary. Barrier Elementary and Tolman High School. Um, and we are recommending uh, the award in the amount of $1,427,000. Motion by Ms. Benolo, seconded by Ms. Grant. Discussion. Um, Ms. Benolo first and Mr. Chabonneau. Okay, so just as a point of information, this did go before the facilities committee and was, was approved. Uh, Pawtucket business participation 0% and MBE 1.5%. Yes, we had a, a pre-award meeting where we did reiterate that we would like to see the MBE come up. Um, they weren't able to commit on the proposal, but they are going to see if they can get more MBE. They said they are struggling to find subcontractors with MBE percentages and Pawtucket business percentages. So we so, are hoping to improve that. But So what is the the MBE percentage or the MBE amount of $16,000, what does that cover? Um, they listed the MBE. I only asked Jared because out of a million four, 16,000 seems like, I, I, I don't know what it could be that I, I believe it was painting, but I may have, I, I've got a. Okay. I, I can get that information back to you. I apologize. I don't have it in front of me. That's all right. When you, when you have it, you can send it to mm -hmm. us. Thank you. Jared, please make sure to send that. So mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, yeah, Jared, it's in the packet. Okay. You're right. 16,000 painting. Yes. So it was right. Um, one note, one thing that I do want to note that was discussed at the facilities subcommittee meeting, um, this dollar amount does not include the two ad alternates. Um, we are, there are two separate uh, additional ad alternates that we had requested on the documents. One was for a storage room, additional storage room at Curtis Elementary School, and that amount came at, at $101,362. And then alternate number two was a janitor's closet at Varrier, uh, two additional spaces. And the janitor's closet came in at $98,920. Um, and we are going to, the, the recommendation from the facility subcommittee was to uh, review the spatial needs in the schools with uh, the administration and also review with finances to see if we can afford it slash if we need it. But right now this award is not inclusive of it and we can add it at a later date if needed. But we'll bring that information back to the facility subcommittee after further investigation. 
All right, so it's not added into this. Mm -hmm. You'll be Correct. coming back to us if you want to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Bella. Yes. Ms. Carney. Yes. Mr. Shabna. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. Ms. Fernandez. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Slow. Yes. All right, next item. Recommendation to award Shea Life Safety System Designer. Thank you. Um, it is the recommendation of Collier's Project Leaders to award uh, the Life Safety System Designer at Shea High School to Jensen Hughes in the award amount of $89,000. Um, this is in response to the uh, NIASC and the $10 million bond um, that was approved, uh, funding source that was approved to address the NIASC items. Uh, this would be to get Jensen Hughes on board to uh, do investigation and design drawings, documents for uh, the life safety systems, the fire sprinkler systems in Shea, and they will investigate the uh, emergency lighting and come up with a plan of action for that as well. Motion by Ms. Grant, seconded by Ms. Bonolo. Discussion? Um, Jared, oh, I'm sorry, Jared. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jared, we, when we prepared for the renovations at Shea, we didn't do this? Uh, this was, um, I, I was not part of the team that did that, but I, I would assume that it was included in it. Um, but we went directly to Jensen Hughes, which I'll verify if they were the subcontractor at the time, but um, they, uh, they, they are on our um, house docks and this is the, contractor that we thought was best to go to. Um, but, but as we move to address some of the NIAS deficiencies at Shea, mm -hmm. are we able to, to use any of the, the work we've already done? So, so relative to the renovations we had planned for. So in response to some of that, yes. So the next re recommendation that I have is to Brewster Thornton Group Architects for the roof replacement. Um, Brewster Thornton Group Architects would have hired a subcontractor. I don't know if they were Jensen Hughes or not to do all of the fire sprinkler work. But if we went through the same architects that we did for Shea previously, they would have to subcontract that fire sprinkler work out anyway. So we went directly to a uh, fire code, uh, fire sprinkler engineer that is on our house docks for this work. But I will say that the next recommendation to award is for uh, the contract, the architect that we had on board for that. Um, those, those documents, I've spoken with BTJ a few times, those documents were brought all the way to design development before uh, the project was halted. So the there is still a decent amount of extensive work for construction documents to have been done further than where they were. If that helps. Okay. The discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Manolo. Yeah. Ms. Carney. Yeah. Mr. Shabano. Yeah. Ms. Dubey. Yeah. Ms. Fernandez. Yeah. Ms. Grant. Yeah. Mr. Shalau. Yeah. Next item. Recommendation to award Shea Roof Replacement Designer. Thank you. Um, it is the recommendation of Collier's Project Leaders to award uh, the Shea High School Roof Replacement to Brewster Thornton Group Architects in the amount of $286,000. Uh, and this is inclusive of the structural repairs needed to the concrete decking uh, above the stage area as well. Second. Motion by Ms. Bonolo, second by Ms. Grant. Discussion, Ms. DeShabano. I have the same question, Jared. We, yes, didn't we, engage, we engaged Brewster Thornton as the design architect at Shea for the renovation. Correct, right. which is why I went back out to them off of the house docks, thinking that they would have the most extensive knowledge of the building as it is. But when, we haven't paid for this work to be done already? So we have documents from Brewster Thornton for schematic design and design development, and they did not go into construction documents, which is where a lot of the detailing and um, the, the nuts and bolts of everything get developed. So I have looked through some of the construction documents on the roofing from the design development drawings, and they are still in more of a schematic. They don't have the detailing aspect of it. So when I reached out to them and got this fee proposal back, my first thought was the same thought. We've already done a, a lot of this. And the response was that while they had done schematic design and design development, there is still an extensive amount of detailing and uh, drafting that needed to be done. Uh, that being said, they did say that the schematic design and design development submissions to ride should be able to go out very quickly since they're already completed. So this is more the construction document phase 
work because they already have some of the other work done. They did say that they do still need to come out and investigate further, um, like the structural decking investigation and stuff like that. So, but, okay. Tomorrow, can you send the committee, if I may, Mr. Chairman, the what we've paid Brewster Thornton relative to the work that they've already submitted to us? Mm -hmm. Because it sounds like this this Shea roof should have been fairly well along now, mm -hmm. and now we're being asked to retain them again for another quarter of a million dollars. Yes, I will look into what their contract was, the full extent of it, um, break out the construction document phases, and then also send along how much we had paid to that point. Uh, it's my, to my knowledge, we only made it through design development, and uh, the documents that I did see had a lot more information on the interiors of the design development than it did the specific roof that needed to be replaced. So I think that during their design, they focused on the um, layout of the building and, and a lot of that aspect, the exterior restoration. And I don't, I don't know that it got as detailed in the roof from the drawings that I had seen. All right. um, but yes, I will certainly send that along. Thank and um, just, just to note, I did look at um, previous roofs <laughs> and the uh, the percentage of construction cost versus the percentage of architect's cost. And this is lower than some of the other ones that we have seen. It's on par with some of the other ones, but it, it is lower percentage wise than some but of them. But not if we combine it with what we've already paid. I'd, I'd have to look at what yeah. we already pay them. We did also pay them for the, an entire building renovation versus just a specific roof, but yes, yes, I agree. Any other discussion? Jared, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure you kept saying it's, this also encompasses the cement slab. Is this full roof replacement of, of, of Shea High School. This is a complete roof replacement. So taking everything from the concrete deck up through the insulation and the roofing membrane material off and replacing it with a new one, as well as over the theater area, they need to re rebuild the structure of the concrete roof decking there. Okay. Yes. So we're talking about the full Shea roof. Full, full Shea roof and additional structural replacement. All so right. that above the auditorium, yes. Just want to make sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Clark, please call the roll. Any other? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Jared, just for clarification, in the in the uh, the doc, it's to approve in the amount of two hundred and seventy thousand, but the recommended motion that the committee award Shea designer services for a total of two hundred and eighty-six thousand. I, I apologize if I left the two seventy in there. The recommended motion was for two eighty-six. So that is inclusive of reimbursables and an electrical design allowance. The thought process being that um, within that allowance, if there is any additional um, funding to be able, like if this bid comes in lower than expected, we wanted to include a couple alternates in there to try and tackle as much um, as much additional NIASC issues came, that came up. There was a phase two in the NIASC that had additional electrical. So the goal with that was to also be able to explore if there is an opportunity to incorporate some of the additional phase two NIAS work into this or not. So that is inclusive. In this. So the total should be 286. Okay. I apologize for my, my 270. That should have been changed. It's a typo. All right. Any other discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Manolo. Yeah. Ms. Carney. Yeah. Mr. Chavano. Yeah. Ms. Doobie. Yeah. Ms. Fernandez. Yeah. Ms. Grant. Yeah. Mr. Shalom. Yes. All right, next item that is on our agenda anyway is recommendation to approve the Baldwin Landscape Playground Designer. Oh, sorry, design. Second. Motion on the table by Ms. Bonolo, seconded by Ms. Grant. Uh, Clark, please call the roll. Ms. Bonolo? Yes. Ms. Carney? Yes. Mr. Chavano? Yes. Ms. Doobie? Yes. Ms. Fernandez? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Mr. Shalow? Yes. Next item on this agenda says recommendation to approve Baldwin 60% construction document submission to RIDE. Second. Motion to approve by Ms. Bonolo, seconded by Ms. Grant. Discussion, Jared, do you have? Thank you, yes. Um, so we have a uh, brief presentation by the architects to go over all of the uh, uh, construction documents and some of the changes that have happened between design development and construction documents. Um, the recommendation here is to approve to submit the 60% construction documents and specifications to Rhode Island Department of Education to continue moving forward with the project. And I will let them take over and go over some of the changes that have happened in the design. Hi, Robert Stack with Toronto Architects, and I'm here with Jonathan Levy. Jonathan Levy Architects, our associate architect. 
And uh, Jonathan is going to go through a presentation where we've just highlighted some of the key changes from DD to CD. Um, so we can just focus on, on what you're seeing here that's different. Gentlemen, I'm, I do apologize. Can that go to the left? To, or to my left? Go to the other left. No. And I'll pull this back. From you. Okay. So um, I just want to say that that's, uh, there, there's only about eight uh, significant changes. In, it's, I guess significant is, is, is a debatable word, but this is just um, as the design develops and we start bringing it more in line um, with recent directives from, from WIDE and how things are, are happening uh, throughout the state in terms of security and also um, changes that we've made working with the end users and the subcommittee in terms of the student bathrooms and configuration and, and location. And then just some um, other, other uh, changes that we made just to bring it more in parity with the um, standards that you are continuing to set and that you used recently at, at Winters. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jonathan to go over some of the specifics. Thank you, Robert. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Good to see you all again. And a special thank you to uh, Superintendent Royal and welcome to our process, both for the Baldwin School and later we'll be looking at the proposals for the new Pawtucket Unified High School. So uh, we look forward to working with you and congratulations on your appointment. So uh, very simply, we're going to review um, the changes that have occurred since the last time you reviewed the designs for the new Elizabeth Baldwin School, uh, which <coughs> was during design development. So since that time, we're working on the portion of an architect's work called construction documentation. These are the technical documents that are used uh, working in concert with Gilbane to actually build the building, which, as you may know, I'm sorry, Shawmut, <laughs> confusing my project, Shawmut, um, uh, to build the building, which, as you know, is already under construction. So we're in, we're in the phase of work now where uh, we're preparing the ground, we're starting to build the foundations. But meanwhile, the process of developing the technical documents has been continuing and unfolding. So the last time you saw this, uh, you know, there were uh, some changes uh, from then. And if you can see my cursor, I'm going to point them out, the highlights of the changes. They're in two main categories. One, actual changes to the design, which I want to bring to your attention. And the second are the things that occur in the normal course of the development of technical documents. So we've added card access uh, throughout for uh, security purposes. The main change has been a change on the request of the facilities committee to, uh, to revise the toilet layouts from the ride preferred version, which is to have individual stalls, back to uh, a standard which is more in concert with what you've done at Winters and other schools that have been renovated, which are referred to by architects as gang toilets. Um, not a very nice name, but uh, toilet, Toilets, group toilets, two group toilets. So I'm going to show you that in some detail. We've added a divider screen to the gymnasium. We've changed the vestibule to, to reflect the current Ryan standard, which has changed only recently, and also added ballistic uh, resistant glass all around them. We've added a shelf above the lockers in grades one through five classrooms, added mechanical space to reflect the change back to uh, what's called displacement air ventilation and away from 
uh, the type of mechanical system that was at the winter school that uh, uh, is not the preference of the district any longer. And then uh, there have been an, a number of very detailed changes on specifications for things like the roof. And I'm going to point out the roof, which um, have been requested by the district. Uh, I built up type of roof, uh, BU uh, type of roof. So those are the highlights of the changes. Now let's look at uh, what those look like in detail. So here's the revised version of the toilets. On the second floor, there are two uh, areas of the second floor toilets to the north and to the south. And here you can see the new toilets with their five, three uh, fixture count. And then also the retention of, uh, of gender neutral uh, accessible bathrooms in each location. So you're having both types both the group type bathroom and the gender, gender neutral bathroom. This is at the south corner of the second floor. This is at the north corner of the second floor. And then in the kindergarten wing, as you may recall, uh, the kindergarten and pre-kindergarten classrooms have self-contained bathrooms within them. Uh, but also we've added uh, more bathrooms on the north wing uh, reflecting uh, the need for the first graders, and then also an additional toilet uh, also for the first grade. And this was uh, discussed in some detail at the previous meeting to make sure that the travel distances made sense from the classrooms to these uh, various bathrooms. So that's a significant change from the last time you saw the plans. The vestibule uh, provides now for a separate uh, dedicated vestibule for faculty and staff to enter the building uh, so that they can be segregated from the main circulation uh, through the, the main vestibule with its Van Keller-like window adjoining uh, the general office area. And then working with Principal Sweezy uh, and her staff, uh, we've gone over every main space in the, in the building, not the storage closets and so on, but every significant space of the building and prepared a presentation as if each one of these was a separate project, which is really the level of emphasis that they deserve, uh, showing each uh, individual surface uh, within each one of those rooms, including the floor and the ceiling. And I'm going to show you a few of those. There, is, there were a number, quite a number of them uh, that we reviewed. And then some of the highlights of uh, what we think is important about them. This is a typical general classroom. And you can see that uh, to the general classroom, we've added some stripes of color. The, uh, the wings of the school are thematized according uh, to uh, their grades. So the, the north face of the north wing has one color on the exterior, south face another color. So there are four different color ways uh, for the school on the exterior. And what we've done is we've brought those same color ways same color themes into the interior of the building as well. So the classrooms, as you can see here, have stripes of color, for example, around the, the LED t uh, monitor and also elsewhere in the classroom to just give some brilliant color uh, that also reflects the theme of that particular grade within the classroom itself. That's the uh, typical classroom. Same thing in the corridor. This is a typical corridor. Uh, with splashes of color uh, along the corridor to give a sense of excitement and also a sense of belonging for the students uh, in each one of their individual academic learning uh, neighborhoods. This is a view of the very important group or project-based learning area. Uh, on the south side of the building, there's one on the north side of the building as well. So these are really the heart of the new 21st century educational program at the new Baldwin School, a, a large open space where collaborative learning can, can occur as a breakout activity from the classrooms themselves. These also will have those splashes of color that I just described. In the library, uh, the library is broken down into many small pieces according to RIDE standards. Uh, Rhode Island has a, a wonderful um, program for its media centers or libraries at the elementary level, where it's broken down into a series of activities. These are furnishings that are going to primarily describe these different activity areas. But we've also taken the trouble as we've developed the, the drawings to create a ceiling, ceilingscape that gives a different sense of scale to different parts of the room, 
For example, over the circulation desk, which you can see here, which is immediately off of the entrance vestibule, we brought the ceiling down with something called a ceiling cloud, uh, which has its own lighting and its own sense of geometry that creates a sense of warmth and welcome for the students as they enter into the library and gives a sense of comfort as well as, this, as the scale of the room comes down to where there's interaction with the librarian. And then we've done the same thing on the other end of the room here where, where we have the story, story book bleachers. And I apologize to those of you who were in the previous meeting for the redundancy. <laughs> I can see some of you uh, losing uh, interest, but uh, <laughs> that's the nature of these dual meetings. So here's a, a, a three-dimensional view of the same thing. The gymnasium, I've never really shown you before. I wanted to mention it to you. Uh, the gymnasium is uh, almost entirely covered with acoustic paneling called tectum paneling, which is a very robust and uh, damage-resistant type of paneling, which is in the upper reaches of this gymnasium. And then on the lower portion, there's athletic padding all the way around consistently for the student's safety. On the east wall of the gymnasium are beautiful, large, clear story windows that will be frosted so that they don't allow direct light with its glare to come into the gymnasium. But this is a gymnasium that will be largely daylit uh, and not relying on artificial, on artificial lighting. Going into the cafetorium, uh, you may remember from some of our fly-throughs and some of our renderings that one large wall of the cafetorium, the one adjoining, adjoining the gymnasium, is actually covered with murals depicting scenes from Pawtucket or however else we want to, to give a theme to that uh, space. So that is really a great giant museum-like display wall that we can choose to, uh, to, to convey what the message that we want to, to the students and to the community. On the other side, there's glazing overlooking the cafetorium from the second floor walkway connecting the two wings, which you can see here, extensive glazing. There actually won't be an opening for student safety, so they'll be able to look out onto the cafetorium, uh, but they won't be able to reach out into the space of it. And then the servery wall, and then finally around the, the stage itself, which is part, the, which is what puts the orium and cafetorium, um, is uh, wood paneling all around it to give a sense of, a, uh, of an important cultural moment within, within the school. One last point uh, around the administration area. Uh, this is the, a breakout uh, drawing of the administration area with its main uh, uh, conference room, which is going to be such an important place for teachers to collaborate uh, and, and, and speculate on what the curriculum should be like uh, together and also to meet with people from the community and with parents. There's a special parent uh, uh, conference room uh, for interviews as they come directly in. Before they can get into the school, there will be a, a, a conference room there. And then all the little offices that are needed, including the principal's office, which is in a very important location observing the coming and going of people coming in into the building when she or he would like to do that. There will obviously be shades and to, and in addition for, for, for privacy. So that, that gives you an overview of the kinds of changes that have developed. Uh, the main change is the toilet rooms, and I'm very pleased to tell you that even though that request came at a very late stage in the process, even while the technical drawings were well underway, we were able to accomplish that working with our very cooperative engineers. There were plumbing engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, all had to be involved in this really taking apart the center portions of the building. Uh, we were able to do that without skipping a beat in terms of the schedule, so we're still going to be able to deliver at the same time. And we don't think that the, the question was asked at the previous meeting whether there was a cost implication. We don't think that there is any cost implication. If anything, perhaps it's even a little, a little less expensive without all those little rooms and doors and hardware and so on. So that, that completes my description. If I'd love to hear your questions or need for clarification. Discussion. Okay, we'll wait for Mr. Chabonneau. Thank you. Yeah, Jay, I'm just curious, when, when we were sent 
the 60% construction document, in, in, the, in the narrative, in the summary, there were multiple references to the work being done in the city of Central Falls. So I'm curious as to one, who reviewed the 60% docs before they got sent to us. And I, the documents had been corrected because I reached out to the chairman and, and he got involved and we've since got them corrected. But where was the oversight on the original packet that was sent to us that referenced doing business with the city of Central Falls, the city of Central Falls fire department, the city of Central Falls waiving fees, Mm -hmm. So um, I can offer an explanation, which is not an excuse, but but a literal what happened. Uh, we we had a deadline. Unfortunately, the spec writing consultant was was running late. And so when I had forwarded all the other documents on to, to meet the deadline, when he emailed me his document, at like nine whatever in the evening i just in an effort to get the information to the people that needed it i just forwarded on the email so and, that and i i appreciate the explanation robert but okay. but the file was sent six days ago we received it two days ago so it was in possession of some members of the committee and and some of you folks for six days. And with, with the money and the layering that this committee has put in to ensure that these projects come in on time, on budget, this is a $60 million taxpayer funded project. And we got sent documents, 60% completion documents that reference Central Falls, the project in Central Falls. And I'm concerned about it. I might be the only one, but but that that bothers me because I think we've taken the time to put in the oversight. We've spent the money. We have very competent people on our team, and if if this can get by, I open the document and in five seconds, I I mentioned it to the chair. I can only offer my heartfelt uh, apology and, and an assurance that I'll do my best that such uh, it, it, mistakes won't happen again. Robert, I, I appreciate that. I, and I'm not saying that you're, you're solely responsible for this. I'm saying this committee has spent millions of dollars building a team to protect our interests. And these, these documents got disseminated to all of us referencing a project outside of the city. That's all I'm saying. I would also just like to offer my uh, apology for not catching the clerical error. Well, uh, my, my focus on the review of the documents that had come in was uh, on other aspects of the design. I, I understand that. But again, this is a $60 million taxpayer project. And we need our team's eyes to be on everything. And I don't know that it was a clerical error. <laughs> It looked like maybe there were there were pages that were just all brought over. Any other discussion? No discussion, clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Manolo? Yes. Ms. Carney? Yes. Mr. Shabna? Yes. Ms. Duby? Yes. Ms. Fernandez? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Mr. Shalla? Yes. Next item, recommendation to award number eight, Baldwin Elementary School Electrical Switchboard and Distribution Panels. Um, motion to approve by Ms. Grant, seconded by, by Ms. Connie. Discussion, Jared. Thank you. Uh, I am here in front of you to make the recommendation to award uh, RTA number eight at Baldwin Elementary <laughs> School for the electrical switchboard and distribution panels. Um, working with uh, Shawmut Design and Construction uh, and Collier's project leaders, uh, we recommend to award the uh, electrical switchboard and distribution panels in the amount of $141,859 to Turtle and Hughes of Stoughton, Mass. Um, uh, I already got it on there. Ms. Grant and Ms. Connie 
Has uh, any other discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Spinolo? Yes. Ms. Carney? Yes. Mr. Chabonneau? Yes. Ms. Duby? Yes. Ms. Fernandez? Yes. Ms. Grant? Mr. Shalal? Yes. All right, next item on our agenda is presentation of design options for unified high school ride stage two submission. Hi, I'm uh, Holly Demers Sawyer from the uh, from Colliers, and we're very excited to talk to you about the high school this evening. I do, uh, Ms. Spinola, do you want to mention that we didn't approach this, we didn't discuss this in facilities, we ran out of time, so I don't know if it's... So we did address this at the stakeholders meeting, and they chose C, option C, so we have A, B, and C in that order. Um, we did not have time to address it at the facilities subcommittee meeting that we had prior to this meeting. So it will have to be addressed at a later date and it will be addressed by the committee tonight. Um, Attorney, I don't know. Mr. Conley? Yes, Mr. Chairman. So, um, as uh, as the chair has has explained, the uh, the subcommittee ran out of time to get to these uh, items J and K um, at their meeting. They understand K and your agenda, um, and there was and there, was, there were subcommittee members here. So by leaving out, they can fill in them. They can fill in the blanks. We always discuss what to do. Um, I did suggest that some action had to be taken um, because it was on their agenda and it's on your agenda as well. The vote that was taken that time was to forward it to the, to forward those topics to the committee this evening um, because it was on your agenda. And it is before you. Um, I, I don't want to overstep um, my, uh, my role as legal counsel but I would make a suggestion um, if, if, time, <laughs> if time allows that now that you have it before the full, full committee, that perhaps you could table it so that the facilities know. I'm getting, I'm getting a no from the chair. So um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Oh, Ms. I, I make the motion to refer it to the, to the committee for okay. time. So. Can we act? Oh, go ahead, Ms. Ms. Grant. And just so you know, um, Attorney Connolly did offer or suggest to us that we do um, maybe kind of talk about it. But the problem is it is a long presentation um, and we kind of let him know that um, because we didn't want to, you know, keep when we told everyone our meeting was at six o'clock, we didn't want to stop late because of so yeah so that was one of the reasons too that we had approved that mm. can i just um chairwoman why can we table this if you as a um, subcommittee hasn't hasn't been able to see this well i think there's only one person on the subcommittee that hasn't in the presentation, but we do have deadlines. What is the deadline? Well, the intent is to talk about, do the presentation, and actually with the hope of a, an option being chosen, which would allow the architect to continue with his design. I think that's the critical piece here. Um, and, you know, just talk about where we are with the schedule and all. Um, I, I, I would love to just keep going and present, but I just wanted to make sure if in fact there is going to be a vote or not. So, Ms. Grant first and Mr. Chabonneau. So I have a question for um, Ms. Benolo. Why has only one person not seen this? Because I haven't seen it. Because most of the people that were, well, aside from this committee, most of the people that are on the subcommittee meeting were also on the stakeholders meeting. So they saw it as the stakeholder. 
So I was Maybe the only. Two. I was the only one besides the. I was the only one who didn't see it. No, maybe three. Even the and teachers at Jen, Baldwin saw it? They're on the stakeholders? They didn't see it, no. Oh, okay. So several people didn't see it. Yeah, because I didn't see it. Mr. Chabonneau. I, I know there's been some talk in the newspapers about the schedule. And seeing that the design option is a lengthy presentation, I would su suggest that we take the submission item uh, letter K and since the, I mean, I was under the assumption that we were on board to submit in September like normal. I've read several things from several different people to the contrary. So why don't we decide when we're submitting and then if we're up against the time crunch, we can go through a lengthy presentation but if, if this committee decides to delay submission, then we can table it, you can bring it to your subcommittee and everybody can go through the process. I, I agree, I've heard, um, and I actually would like to defer to Mr. Conley. Uh, unless, Chairman, do you want to uh, talk to, uh, Mr. Chauvin is correct about the submission date. Uh, it, the, sta so the state has given- The motion would be to move item K. No, I'm just asking, I, I'm just right, asking. but we would, we can discuss that first and then make a decision on the other. Okay, so you want to take up letter K, you're saying? Take up letter K. Do any of, any, anyone object to taking letter K right now? All right, letter K. Ride stage two submission for Unified High School. Do I have a motion? Motion. Ms. Benolo. Seconded by Mr. Chavanel. Discussion on stage two submission for Unified High School. Holly, did you want to speak on that? Did Mr. Who wants to speak on that? I'd be more than happy to Go ahead. jump in. Okay. Um, well, we all know when the work started on the stage two of the high school ride funding schedule required a stage two submission for September 15th because the bonus points were expiring at the end of the calendar year. Um, the General Assembly voted sometime in June saying that they would extend the bonus points to June, which allowed, and the intent of that was for all of these districts throughout the state that have large scale projects, um, that they would have more time to dive in and to have a more comprehensive application when they do submit. Um, so it's an option. Um, we have been going along with the intent of submitting in the fall, but there have been changes with the administration and the CFO and different things in Pawtucket. And really it's a $300 million school. So it's it really, it's really much more about a conversation as to whether or not we take this as an opportunity to dive in further with these design options and keep going and submit. And they say February, but um, if that's something you wanted to entertain, we could submit in January. I mean, there's no reason not to submit earlier, um, but we do need to know based on the timeline, September versus, um, you know, early, win yes, early winter. Um, so Holly, I don't know if it's you or Attorney Connolly who can answer this because this might um, kind of make the determination. Um, do we have site control yet? No. We do not have site controls. So if we can get site control, because we need site control to submit stage two. Yes. So if we can get site control, um, I'm assuming it's being talked about right now and it, it, because if we can't get site control by September 10th, then that's out of, or if we can get site control, once we get site control, can the city take it back? Mr. Conley, did you wanna? Yeah. yeah. So um, you're absolutely right that for the stage two submission, um, we need to provide ride um, with a guarantee of site control. 20 boxes need to check off. Um, in the previous project, we, that wasn't necessarily a part of the stage two because we already had site control. And what site control means in this context 
is that care, custody, and control provision under Title 16. Now, the school district has care, custody, control of those premises, and the purpose is obviously of getting that care, custody, control is so we can build a unified high school on the site. Um, uh, I've had a discussion with Ryan about that, um, and um, I've also had discussions with the uh, uh, solicitor uh, for the city um, and have, in fact, uh, provided <coughs> a draft of the resolution um, for um, the council to enact that would give us site control. Site control is just that. It's not, it's not a transfer of title. The title always resides in the city. It's that care, custody, and control components of Title 16. Um, my understanding in talking to the solicitor as recently as yesterday that the um, the resolution is ready to go. Um, it was, my understanding is it is going to be provided by the solicitor to the council for that purpose. I don't know exactly when, um, but I certainly did not um, hear anything from the solicitor that there was any hold up in getting it done. So the, what we talked about yesterday were the details of identifying the property properly. Um, and I think we resolved um, how the city will do that. Yes, they have to. So I know that that's in the works without being able to say to the committee to the date that it's being worked on. Um, and um, I do know in those discussions with Rye um, that the passage of that resolution. Um, once we receive site control, so say I'll know what the newspapers say. Um, if can the city take site control back from us, or would we have to determine whether we would be willing to transfer that back to them? And my second question is. But I would think before we could vote tonight on a submission, um, because like I said, we were all under the impression we were going to be ready and do this for September. Um, I think we need to know when this document can be here because there might be members, it might be the whole committee or none of the committee but might want to kind of keep on track and keep moving this forward for, for our students. Um, because we all know that the other schools just aren't really in that great a shape. Please. Yes, so, so I'll give you, I'll give you my answer to that. I'm not saying it represents the city's answer to it, but I'll tell you what my answer is. So when we have site control for purposes of title 16, there's also a finding, and it was a finding in order for us to get this far in the process. Um, that finding would be that, that we, this city, this district, has a need for this unified high school for this high school. Now, <clears throat> high school's not constructed yet, but under Title 16, before a district can abandon. <clears throat> A school facility, and I understand it's not built yet, but there's been that determination of need, the required site control. Um, there's a process that you have to go through with Rye in order to abandon um, a property that meets those qualifications of the Title 16. So, my answer to that is that it would require that formal process and Rye approval, even though we haven't constructed the building on it yet. We've nevertheless sort of met all that criteria. <coughs> That we, in my mind, that requires that process to be followed. So my answer is not without going through that process, not without right attorney, that we don't be there anymore. So um, the the answer is it would have to go through that same formal process that any district would have to go through in order to abandon a property over which it has gained site control. So I just want to clarify: if we receive this, if we receive site control then that would be the case. Yes. But if we don't receive site control, it there's still it's still their site. That is correct. Okay. All right. So I guess it, we really need to figure out if we're gonna 
when we're going to get site control because we can't submit stage two until we get site control. And we can't determine when we want to submit because we don't know. Right. And with the, the level of detail of plans that are required within the stage two and the multiple financial documents and all the, you know, and the master planning and all of that, that is all part of the stage two, which is why timing is relevant to all of this conversation and choosing which direction also recognizing that these are models where it's if you know after the presentation whether it happens tonight or another night all of these models are not set in stone it could be an a, you know a with a part of b so i think it's just a matter of allowing us to keep going so the architects can get pricing so we can do financials it's a it's a whole trickle down right so it's your the site control is one ex exhibit of 50 um, it's really relevant, but all of these exhibits are time sensitive. So, which is why we're here. Um, so, Aaron, you had your hand up, and then Mr. No, I have the same question. Oh, same question, then Mr. Shabano. Holly, how much, what was the budget for the stage two submission? The stage two submission, how much has been spent to date, please? It's what, or where, the, where we are for contracts and all? Yeah, and I'm what was the overall cost? I, where we are now, probably about 2.5 million. And whatever happened last spring, we had done the ad hoc as well. And, and it, we're on track to submit as originally planned for September, if correct? We, yes, if we get answers to right. these questions, yes. And and the modeling here that, that we'll look at in, but, but to be clear, this, we haven't even selected, we've selected Mr. Levy to be the architect of stage two, yes. but we have not selected an architectural firm to design the high school itself. Stage two requires a schematic design, which is very, very much a designed high school. Mm -hmm. It has mechanical, electrical plumbing, it has everything. And we having two demographic studies done right now, ride one and two, um, to dictate the size of the school and what will, based on you know, the changing demographics in the city. So to say it's not a full blown design, it wouldn't be accurate. It, it's very much a schematic. We used to say, right, schematic design, then it goes into DD. But RIDE used to be much less, um, the, the level of detail they required before was much less than it is now. They, they dive in deep at the schematic level, which is the stage two. And, and from a, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm gonna ask the question because I've, I've heard it said several times. On that parcel across the street, yes. is there any conceivable way that a unified high school sits and a new stadium sits on the same parcel? I would have to say the architect, I mean, the this, this, this stadium as it sits now plus a high school? Right. I can't imagine that the land would ever hold that. And rough square footage on a new unified high school is about 500,000. Correct? We're still working off that? 475. 475. 475,000 square feet. Okay. What, what's the average Home Depot? Do you know? <laughs> Big. 100,000? So Unified High School's about four Home Depots on that spot. Okay. Well, because you're going up. Right. right, but you're right. going, you're yeah. going up, but you're going to have the, the fields. Fields and, right, and parking. parking. And yes, <laughs> okay. yes. Um, Ms. Vanola? So one of the primary reasons I had asked that um, we consider submitting in February or January is because Ms. Royal is new to our district. Um, we don't have a principal at Shea. We don't have a CFO. Um, who knows how to move the money and to be caretaker of the money. And although we have a good business office, we don't have a business manager to put it all together yet. And without those things, I think it's a tricky walk to go where we're going without someone keeping actual track of everything. Well, do do we not have someone keeping track of everything? I mean, this this was all agreed to 
months and months ago. It's been in the process for a while. I've got to think. Yeah, there are multiple exhibits in the stage two that are financial. Typically, they come in the last six weeks to a month just because we need to have an estimate of the high school and then do projections and operating costs of the existing schools. All of that typically comes from in the past has been working with um, Melissa, well, Melissa Devine. So that role has not, we have not been given a person yet that would be um, helping us with those details. But to be fair, it's early right now that I, I wouldn't be able to walk in there now and say I need this, this, and this until we get a little bit further along with the design. No, I'm, no, ahead. So I know we've been in this situation before in the past, you know, several years where we were given a deadline by ride. Um, it seems to be a real tight deadline mm -hmm. and we push for it. We meet it. The rest of the state doesn't meet it. And then ride says, guess what? No one in the state met it except Pawtucket. So we're going to move it back for everyone else to kind of catch up. And this has happened numerous times. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I would like to hear whether in your professional opinion, mm -hmm. you believe we have an opportunity to meet that September deadline. Um, I, I understand that we're waiting for a document, but if, is it going to either a cost more to do this work in this aggressive timetable with the, the timetable we originally had, mm -hmm. is it going to cost more to work this way? Or do you think, and or, sorry for the multiple questions, do you think the work will be done not up to the par that we need it to be if we push in this aggressive way? I think for a more comprehensive submittal, having a few months would, of course, that's the whole point, right? It would be helpful. Will it cost more? No, it wouldn't cost more either way. The prices that you have from your consultants are for the deliverable, right? So that doesn't come into account. Um, I, you know, can we deliver in September? Would it be as much um, comprehensive as it would be if it was in January? No, it's just the nature of time. Do I think having uh, members of the administration that are new to be brought into the fold and really get some input or the financial department? Of course, all of that would help us. There's no question. There are lots and lots of exhibits. Everything's moving. Um, you know, everything is moving. There's nothing. I, I would not stand up here and say we cannot meet September. That is not the case. But there is a reason why, you know, when we spoke to Ride, Ride said, is Pawtucket taking advantage of this opportunity to dive deeper? I mean, that is basically the consensus for a project of this scale. And so it's really nothing more than us bringing this opportunity to you and let us, uh, letting us know what direction you want. Sorry, I just have one quick follow-up in my mind. Um, if we push for the September mm -hmm. deadline and we submit and Ride says this was not the comprehensive look we were hoping for. We want you to go back out. What does that look like? Does that look <clears> like <throat> us going out to bid again for stage two? Does that look like we just take our plans back and we continue with the same team we've had to clarify those errors and then submit again in February? Is that what that looks like? Yes. So typically what with any stage two, whether it's like 99% perfect, you're going to get a deficiency letter. Or, or if, you know, if we do the very best we can based on the timeline we have in the timeline where we started, we'll, we would get a deficiency letter. What would be really critical to do is once a design intent is chosen, then we would meet with Ride immediately so they can, in, you know, take a look, get their sense of it because this is such a big investment. So we have not gone to Ride yet. I mean, we've talked to them about the high school, of course, and you know, we, we talked to them about the demographic study, right? Because it was critical to determine the size of the school based on demographics. And we had one demographic study ordered and based on a conversation with Dr. DeSolver, <clears throat> excuse me, you wanted to. <clears throat> but those are gonna be in, like the draft is like, today we actually talked to uh, Cropper. So the size of the school is based on the demographics. So all of those things are critical. The architects have been moving at a clip keeping on track based on the information we had when we had it. Uh, a couple of things, Holly. One, so we're talking January, February. 
we can submit at any time, but Ride Only looks at them in September and February, correct? They're due, like the formal date is, yes, is September. If we in, just say, you said, let's, let's submit in November, they will still be looking at September's. So you don't want, you know, because they, they're going to get, you know, uh, most of the districts from what I have heard and conversations that had comprehensive plan, uh, plans of this stat status are, are punting because of the need to just buy time and really dive deeper. So, it, but when we initially started out on this path and, and we, we took on the stage two unified high school, I recall conversations with this committee that we were paying a premium because of the tight timeline we were asked. Premium by whom? Well, we were paying a premium. You tell me. I mean, no, I, I think, I mean, honestly, you're all, everyone's looking for the same um, consultants, right? The demographics and all. But as far as the negotiated contracts, basically, you have the architect and his fee was below standard of what a tip of, you know, was under a, a half a percent, which is standard. And it wouldn't have mattered. I think the reality is when they, when Pawtucket specifically decided to pull the trigger on the high school, I think it was January, February, right? There was no doubt that it, it was a heavy lift. We all knew we could do it because we've done it before and we can pull it off. But the scale of the project and just the fact that the, the state recognized that they were going to have all these huge projects rushed in um, at the same time. They realized, okay, this isn't fair. So they did what they did. But I don't think as far as a premium of time that it would take and, and trying to get it in and get a quality product for Pawtucket, maybe that was the conversation, but the actual cost of it, it the fee structure was typical of any stage two. Nope. Ms. Grant? Um, just a reminder to everyone too, at one time, we decided to take a pause with Shay and Tolman and take three months. And, you know, the Unified High School came out of it, the idea of it. But we would have almost been done with Tolman and Shay. And I'm just worried. I, I really think we just need to keep going. I don't think we need to take these pauses and uh, I think we need to get site control. I think we need to submit in September. I, I think we need to keep this going for the students. Um, uh, I think everyone's been preparing for this. Um, our district still runs every day without a Melissa Devine and, you know, um, and it's still going to run tomorrow, but I think we've noticed in the past that if we wait, if we take these pauses, something could happen. You know, it's it's still seven months away, February from from now. Any other questions? All right, Miss um, Pinot, can you state? your um your motion though just because there's a few dates that were thrown out there so what's your what's, oh diana do you capture it the motion for the date oh i thought i'm sorry i thought you actually stated the date no. all right <laughs> so what is your um what's the motion for the date what's what what's so i would you? like to move the ride stage two submission for the unified high school to January 2024. Go ahead, Mr. Shaman. I, 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 January 2024. The, oh, the, the dates to submit are September and February. February 2024. So the motion is to submit in February of 2024 for stage two, take advantage of what the state, what RIDE has, actually the state legislator um, without, penalty. without penalty. All right. Discussion on that? Yes, Mr. Shavano. No, no, no. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Second. second, Mr. Shavano. Um, but just there was there was a point with a two hundred and fifty million dollar bond 
where we got our stuff in and we we were the beneficiary of the lion's share of the of the state money or was that the the initiative the uh fei initiative fei initiative. because we were prepared to go we got it was nine million and we got five of it right or they're about yeah i mean I, it's from the timeline of those different grants it's all different but yes Are we are we leaving money on the table by pushing it back? No. Because no. Oh, okay. No, but if we're the only ones to submit in September, then Ride looks at our submission and moves us along the path, and everybody else is submitting in February. Is my point. There were going to be. I've been told that there were going to be about twenty six submissions in September for stage two. So. I don't know what the percentage is of the bigger projects that are, you know, waiting and doing and just being more thorough. I don't know, but it's def it, it might be split. I don't know. Any discussion on the motion to push the submission for stage two to ride to February of 2024? Any more discussion? Clark, please call the roll. Ms. Benolo. Yes. Ms. Carney. Yes. Mr. Chabonneau. No. Ms. Doobie. Ms. Fernandez? No. Ms. Grant? No. Mr. Shalal? Yeah. So that brings us back to submission of, do we have to take a vote on, you guys have already voted the previous school grade September 15th. We don't, do you need a motion of vote to do September 15th? Well, we're good. So we're just going with September 15th. Okay. So with that, the motion of uh, the uh, next item, are we going to be doing letter J presentation design options for Unified High School, or are we going to table? We, we must. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Holly, you, uh, well, Jared, whoever wants to. No, I have. So we're going to do a presentation, and Jonathan Levy will um, basically review what we've accomplished to date and where we are to date, and we'll keep it as controlled and short as possible without missing any information. Um, at the end of the presentation, after the questions and all, the hope is that a design option will be chosen, so it'll allow the design team to keep going on a clip. Just give me one moment to uh, prep here. Shift gears from Baldwin. So I'm going to take between 10 and 15 minutes. Would that be acceptable, Mr. Chair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just thrilled to be here with you tonight uh, to describe all the difficult and hard work that's been done, not just by the professionals, but also by the many contributors from the community and from the district over the past several months. Um, so I'm going to very briefly recap the kind of work that's been done, and then we're going to get right into the design presentation. So uh, this is our agenda. I'm going to review the process. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about one half of what uh, you need to know in order to build a new school, which is the one half is the site. The other half is the program, uh, the program being the uh, vision, educational vision that you, Pawtucket, are bringing to this new school, and then the breaking down of that vision into the detail of actually every space and the size of every space and what its purpose is. So a lot of work has been done uh, in, in, in that direction. Um, I just wanted to mention to you that there has been uh, two 
uh, important groups that have participated. One is the leadership committee, uh, which consisted of uh, the, uh, the senior administration here in the district and uh, together uh, <clears throat> with our team. And then the other is the very important stakeholder group, uh, which has actually done the lion's share of the work of reviewing and, uh, and discussing. The meetings that have taken place to date, um, um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but the most important meeting that took place was two days, two full half days, it was more than half days, of meetings called, called visioning sessions, uh, where we brought together not only staff, uh, faculty, and, um, and, and the design professionals, but also members of the community, including students. Uh, to to talk about what the vision is for education for Pawtucket for the future. There have also been a lot of focus group meetings taking place at the individual schools, Tolman and Shea, with each individual uh, department within the school, both academic and in terms of facilities and athletics, and all of those folks have contributed to the detail of the programming uh, stage of the process. I'm going to buzz through these very quickly because uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time. But in terms of the visioning, uh, we tried to probe the values of the district, tried to understand what the culture and identity was, what the relationship to the community would be. We created priorities uh, that were identified using cards and uh, individual tables made contributions. Uh, which were very exciting having to do with it. These are some of the priorities that they came up with among many other choices, inclusion, safety and security, uh, energy need reduction, community access, equity, emotional re resi resiliency. The questions that we asked in person uh, with uh, all of these folks groups included, how can we unify the two schools together through programming and design? How can we bring the history and tradition of these two schools together? How can your work, you, your work being faculty and staff, be facilitated by the new school? How can we improve the student experience? And I know we're going to improve the student experience. How can the new school improve inclusion and special education, improve safety and security? And then, this has become really the theme of our project. How can we combine general education and career technical education in a way that gives honor and respect to both, uh, and so that both work together symbiotically. This is called comprehensive education, and we're working to build a comprehensive uh, high school. Not a career technical education high school, not an academic high school, but one where those two things are integrated, and not only in concept, but also in physical space. And I'll be showing you in a moment how we did that. So a great deal of the focus is on the career technical education programs, and we had to dive into the ones that are offered to date. These are the ones that are currently offered at uh, Shea Tolman and also at the uh, Arts uh, <coughs> JMS, uh, JMW High School. Um, these are the ones that are offered today. Uh, and we also explored potential new CTE pathways some of these are just coming directly from, uh, from, from the staff and from the faculty. Um, we had wonderful ideas about uh, new CTE programs that might be included, keeping in mind that many of the CTE students in our district are, being, are going out of the district to get their training elsewhere. We want to bring those back into the, into the district. That's one of the really exciting goals of this uh, new uh, unified high school. These are some of the potential CTE pathways that were identified in these visioning sessions. And here's uh, a synthesis of what we think uh, we're building towards. Uh, the existing ones at both Shea and Tolman, and then the additional new uh, proposed CTE pathways, many of which are indicated by the kinds of industry requirements that are in our state. Uh, what's going on in the state? What are the demands uh, for new graduates of high schools? And how can we fulfill uh, a, a, a pipeline from the new high school uh, to those industry uh, requirements outside of the high school? 
reducing all of that down to uh, what are called space summary uh, or space programs. Uh, I'm not going to show you that. It's a long list of, of items uh, that actually detail every space within the school, as I mentioned earlier. But I'll show you the graphic that is kind of a synthesis of what uh, or a summary of what that relates to. We explored three different kinds of high schools based on ideas that were put out during the visioning sessions and our discussions in the fo focus groups. One kind of high school was had two schools within a school. Keeping in mind this is a 2,100 student roughly is our assumption. 2,100 students, a huge building, large community. We want to break that community down into smaller learning subcommunities. One idea was two schools, uh, 9 and 10 and 11, 12 separated. Another idea was a school that was composed of a series of houses, vertically integrated, each 9 through 12, so four 9 through 12 houses. And then the one that we arrived at through the stakeholder group was the idea of two schools, again, but a ninth grade academy, which is an idea favored by, at the time, the two principals who were advising us, and then a second portion of the school, which would be the grade 10 through 12 cohorts. And in this large overview uh, diagram, you can see that the schools, uh, uh, the grades are have intermixed within them the CTE bubbles, as architects call it. This is a bubble diagram. The gray matter indicating the school community and then the CTE bubbles intermix with all of them, and then the central functions at the beginning, at the middle, and then breaking that down now into actually all the different component programming, uh, where you can see how each one of these classroom uh, uh, or cohort, grade cohorts, is clustered around its own learning commons. So learning commons is uh, similar to what we just talked about at the Baldwin, is a place where 21st century collaborative education, project-based education can occur. So each one of these clusters of, uh, of six classrooms would have its own learning commons. We got pushback from that, uh, toward, from that idea. Uh, the faculty and the administration prefer to have fewer of the learning commons, but still have the collaborative spaces, but have fewer of them, and that's reflected in the uh, designs that went forward. So combining the programming ideas together with the site, and now looking at three completely different ideas of high schools, um, we came up with alternatives. Our idea of making alternatives is trying to look under every stone and make sure that you can see the totally diverse possibilities uh, that are inherent in that site and in that program. So we arrived at three entirely different uh, concepts of what uh, the school could be, and we married them to those three different ideas of what a school, how you would break the school down. Remember the two school idea, uh, the vertically uh, uh, organized uh, houses, four houses, or the, uh, the ninth grade academy with a larger high school. So we married those to three different physical configurations. The first one we're calling campus. Uh, there's a lot of interest in making a campus. Campus for high school would be a place where there would be separated buildings intermixed with important outdoor space. Remember how important in higher education that outdoor space is. It's a place where people commingle uh, in unprogrammed ways, in, place, in ways that cause uh, disciplines to interact with one another. These are two campuses that I think are pretty emblematic. One of them you all know very well is Brown University. Another one is the University of Rochester. Second version is the idea of a little city, a place breaking down that uh, 475,000 square feet. Uh, what do we say? Nine uh, Home Depots or whatever it is. Uh, breaking that down into a place where there are identifiable hubs, where there are identifiable locations and associating those locations with different programs. So this, these are ideas of what a little city might look like uh, as a new high school on the left. All of you know this is Rome uh, with <clears throat> But making identify lo identifiable locations and on the right, the city of Washington, which is uh, one of the famous 
examples of a city which has identifiable locations or squares within it that then could associate particularly accurate academic functions with. And then a third idea came from, uh, I think, uh, the most exciting thing about Pawtucket. Uh, for someone visiting Pawtucket, one of the first things that you notice about it is that it's a city of towers, that there are places that are clearly marked within the city that have to do with vertical expression. The city hall is one of the most important. What an amazing gesture, what an amazing uh, uh, moment of civic pride that was to raise up that vertical marker in the middle of Pawtucket. Uh, or Tolman itself, or the Slater Mill with its tower, or the several churches that are around town. So to me, if I was to paint a portrait of Pawtucket, it would be a portrait that included uh, those towers. So the third idea included the idea of a tower. And this is uh, taking a drone and rising it above McCoy Stadium, and then looking out to the city and what the view uh, would be like. So uh, these are the three options. You see them in front of us. Uh, the first one on the left, on my right, is the, uh, is the campus version. And the campus version has four in, in vertically integrated houses. I'm going to show you these in much more detail in just a second. In the middle is the B version, the little city. And then finally, the Pawtucket Tower uh, at the end. These are just photographs of the model. So with that, I'm going to give you a live. I'm going to give you a live tour. Is that what's happening? Okay, I'm not going to worry about that so much. So this is the first version, which is the A version. And what you're seeing are four classroom wings. Each classroom wing represents a different house. And they might have different names. I'm not sure what the names would be, Slater or whatever. In between all of these is a campus quadrangle with the media center as its theme. And then off to one side are the series of common core areas, including the art classrooms, the athletic facilities, and then finally, a performing arts center with its uh, performing arts hall front and center on uh, Division Street. So here you can see Division Street in the foreground. And on this side, Columbus Ave, it's mismarked as Columbia. We know that it's Columbus Ave on one side here. And we're thinking that the major approach to this is certainly going to be from along Division Street and that we want the building to present itself to the city along the, the intersection of Division and Columbus uh, Avenue. So there would be a marker here, uh, which would be for signage to describe Pawtucket itself. And then the entrance to the school would be uh, here to the left. Performing arts. And there's a couple of things that all of these have in common that I wanted to mention to you. The first and most important is the retention of the existing uh, football field. There's no reason to move it. Uh, we'd like to improve it, probably add uh, more bleachers and a press box and so on, but that can certainly stay where it is. All of these have about 450 uh, parking spaces. We don't know that we need that. Uh, we're currently in the midst of having consultants add their information to this whole project. We've got a traffic study underway. We have a demographic study underway. We have site survey, which is nearing completion. We have hazardous material survey of the existing McCoy Stadium to not understand uh, the costs of, of removing it. And then I can take the roof off for you, and you can see the general disposition of the program elements. These are different colors because these are the different houses. They're all connected internally. A campus doesn't really make sense in the higher ed sense for 
uh, in high school. We need to, we don't want to be taking our jackets and coats on and off during winter to get from one place to another. So they're all connected by a, a walkway system. And here's the lobby for the school and for the performing arts, which would be the community access. And then in the back here would be the, um, the gymnasia, all the different health aspects. And then interspersed among them, these larger pieces that are popping out here are the CTE components, including automotive, which would be at the back here, where it would need access for service, and the uh, construction technology also on the ground at, at the back. So this might look like an architectural plan. It's not really yet. It's just demonstrating the overall size of the building, which we know at 475,000 square feet. This is a three-story version. So all these are all three-story uh, elements and roughly indicating to you the number of classrooms that are needed and the, the, the major locations of the, of the main pieces. That's the campus version. Uh, yes, the cafeteria and that uh, approach. Shall I go back to it? Yeah, let me do that. So in this, we put the cafeteria right up front. So I think that a cafeteria should be in a place where it's very visible so that it's not just relegated to food service so that it actually becomes a, a teaching and learning space. So we put it in a prominent location so that that can be a collaborative learning space as well. So that's what's indicated here. When we get to the next stage of design, there'll be a lot more detail. Each one of these rooms will be labeled, they'll all be uh, they'll all have quantities of space and so on. Yes. Early on in the Unified High School subcommittee, yes. we did some survey work. You did, and yes. So that was provided to you, correct? It was, but it was meager information. That You're referring to the stage one process. So that's the, what preceded us, yes. They did. We had one done. And I recall it being explained to us the initial layout of the building was such to keep the the real severe areas of soil contamination. Right. <coughs> untouched. This way we could cap it with with a parking lot. And all of these buildings don't look like it like that would be the case. Okay. So I had heard the same thing when we started, but when we went back to the geo-hazardous uh, consultant, we were told that there were no specific areas of, of intensive uh, contamination that was pretty uniform. So that, that was not borne out by the report that we had from our geo-hazardous -haz person. Apparently, I'm not sure where that information initially came from because I was operating under that assumption as well. And the first question I asked was, where can we go put a building and where shouldn't we put a building? And the answer in the end was when we when we interviewed and saw the report was doesn't really matter. Yes. Go ahead, Helene. Uh, Mr. Chavano, the report that you're referring to was shared with the architects and the contact information from those firms that that is who you spoke with so yeah. they spoke directly to the same group that presented to us last spring so maybe it was how the question was asked i don't know but that it is all the same players so for those of you who don't know uh the site has a really interesting history that used to be Hammond Pond. So the reason why the site is depressed like that is because that, that, that is actually the banks of the pond that you're seeing as you go down into the McCoy Stadium site. So any, any hazardous materials would have come from the filling that was done just before World War II when Hammond Pond was filled in to create the stadium. So what they're telling us is that the so-called urban fill is pretty uniform throughout the whole pond site. 
So that, that, that's the history of the site. Well, let me make sure by getting back to you with a co written confirmation of what I've just told you. So the second approach, oh, no, we don't need that. The second approach is the little city approach. And this again has the in common with the others, uh, the retention of the existing field whose name just flew out of my mind. What's the name of the field? Pariso, Pariso field, yes. So Pariso field uh, is retained and improved. 450 parking spaces, a cir circulation system all around the perimeter of the site. Once again, focusing on the intersection with Division and Columbus. Avenue with two, two drop-offs here. This one also has a campus quadrangle uh, as a welcome area with flags all around it. The media center is buried in the middle of everything. This one is the approach that uh, takes a separated uh, ninth grade academy, which is in this wing, and it has its own lobby and own administration at the front. Then the cafetorium and the uh, the access to the rest of the school is on this secondary uh, turnaround here with the Performing Arts Center uh, off to the west, uh, I'm sorry, to the east. And let's take the uh, roof off of this one. So here you can see the entrance to the school for the ninth uh, through the 10th through 12th graders. These are organized by grade. As we move back, this is the 12th grade at the back, ninth grade, as I just mentioned here, up front, and then 10th and 11th in their own areas, each one having its own small courtyard to give it an, a sense of identity. And then connecting them all is this curving main street, which uh, moves from the back front of the building all the way to the back where there would be a parent drop-off entrance. The 12th graders would have their own courtyard as well. And as I mentioned, the media center in the middle here is the center, the kind of nucleus of the entire uh, ensemble. And then just one more to uh, share with you, which is uh, approach C, the Pawtucket Tower. So why did we do this? I, McCoy Stadium is such an important element in the fabric of of the city of Pawtucket, its culture, its sense of pride. And we thought how important it would be to erect a new symbol of pride, a new beacon of hope for, uh, for the city. So let's raise up the CTE programs, uh, in this case, uh, science and engineering, raise them up into a tower, uh, which is seven stories in height, You'd be entering at the Division Street entrance uh, level, which is uh, a full story above the main uh, level of the McCoy Stadium site. So you'd be entering at the second floor level here. And this is what it would look like uh, as you approach from downtown. You would approach into a small courtyard. And then the middle would be the Learning Commons cafeteria, cafeteria with Media Center and then surrounding it, a series of uh, classroom wings, which we would try to make as uniform as possible in order to save costs. The auditorium, the gymnasia uh, is off on this side, and then a bunch of CTE, uh, other CTE classrooms overlooking uh, the main um, cafeteria media center space. And we'll take the roof off of this. And here you can see the tower landing in the cafeteria media center, and then the classroom wings sort of clustered uh, and encircling uh, the main tower with the uh, 
the, the connecting tissue of the cafeteria uh, in between. So uh, we had uh, quite a, uh, an interesting conversation with the stakeholders. In the end, I, I think I need to report to you that the stakeholders landed on this last approach. I think the reason for it uh, was that there was a sense that it was more compact, which it is more compact. The travel distances are, are, are shorter, even including travel distance from the outer ring to into the tower and going up into the tower. There are a number of examples around the country of schools which have multi-story components. There's one by our collaborative uh, architect, the LR group, who's not, un unfortunately their flight was canceled tonight. We would have loved to have had them here to answer your questions about the programming. Uh, they've done a nine-story uh, school. Uh, but this would just be a portion of the program up into the tower, the CTE portion, which we're really trying uh, to celebrate. The other aspect of this that I think is somewhat compelling is the uh, reduced cost that comes from having a tower and having a compact footprint. So uh, up to a certain height, buildings, uh, multi-story buildings are actually less expensive uh, because of the reduced roof and reduced foundation over a certain height when you start having to deal with wind loads, they become more expensive. So that explains why uh, this is the least expensive likely of the schemes. Although I don't think that was the major factor in, in uh, being considered in terms of premiating this particular option by the stakeholders group. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to field questions. I'm sure it's a lot to absorb. Yes, Jay. On the, the tower, what's the, the X area is, is there? I mean, if that was the, the version <coughs> we went with, what, what's the X area of that tower look like? Is it just a concrete tower? Is it a glass not, tower? Not concrete, not concrete. <laughs> no, no. I, I think most likely this building is going to be mostly brick. So brick is the least expensive thing you can put on a building. And I also think it's the warmest and it's also the one that signifies school. So it would be a combination of brick and glass, mostly brick. About 30% of the uh, an energy efficient school is glass. So only 30%, the remaining 70% is some kind of solid material, most likely brick with some feature material. But the next stage, when we really start to develop the plans, depending on which approach you think is necessary or some combination, as Holly was telling you, um, we will start exploring what the elevations look like on the outside. Yes, so thank you for reminding me of that. So that uh, Chair Manolo was very quick to, to note notice that because of the more compact footprint, it allowed us to include a baseball field where the others that are more spread out do not. Sure. Is BMW included in this design? Okay. It is not. Okay. It is not, I although- just I just was a little confused because I just wanted to be sure. Um, I I'm not sure if the CTE director is here tonight, but there, there is graphic design, uh, which I think is in, in JMW that would come over to the new school. That's one of the CTE programs that was in that list. So uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Sure. Um, it, was, it was very um, informative and you did a great job kind of laying out the three different ones. Um, so I gravitated initially towards that city approach. I think that it had a lot going forward with the um, with the ninth grade individual wing. Um, and I really love the idea of the courtyards for the mm -hmm. different areas. Um, but I'd love to hear more about, um, because I'm not the one who's gonna be in this school building as the yeah. stakeholders are, I'd like to hear more about what those conversations were about why, wh how they felt about that city one and what about this one? I, I, I didn't notice the baseball diamond, uh, but uh, noticing the baseball diamond, um, whether that was what stood out to them. Because I, I don't think, unless I'm wrong, they weren't really emphasizing the cost savings. So what no. made the stakeholders gravitate towards this one educationally and as a place that they wanted to be in? 
Well, I'm going to turn it over to the stakeholders because there are a number of them here in the room okay. uh, to speak for themselves. But uh, I would like to say that it's not an either or kind of conversation. It's so what is the base that we want to start working from? For example, you mentioned two features that we can easily incorporate into yeah. this uh, Pawtucket Tower approach. For example, the courtyards. Um, there are courtyards in this approach as well that we can develop as, as focuses for clusters of classrooms. And then the second thing, as you mentioned, the ninth grade sure. academy. And uh, I mean, I have to confide in to you that we've actually started to sketch and think about you know, how to develop these schemes. Uh, and I would think that this would become the ninth grade academy right here. So there is a, a good argument for not making a dedicated building for the ninth grade academy, but have it integrated into the whole school so that maybe that idea falls out of favor 20 years from now, so that there's a, a way to have flex, a flexible use of that same space. So uh, what I'm just trying to illustrate is that we can incorporate things that are important to you from other schemes and build them into this one as well, if this is the, if this is the starting point. So I'll let the stakeholders uh, respond in terms of you know, why they favored one scheme over another. Uh, Put B back up. Sure. <clears throat> and in case you're wondering, I don't have a favor. <laughs> I think they'd all be terrific schools. Um, would you like the uh, roof, the overview, or do you want to see the plan? No, that that's fine. Uh, what was the overall consensus of that stakeholder meeting? And who was who was involved in that? Um, oh, I gave you a whole huge list. You want to go back to that? Oh, oh, I didn't. I, I, I don't have a good angle. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's just in general. I don't need everybody. There were shares. There were comments. There Here's the list of members. Um, boys and girls club. But, but of the people who are going to be working in the building of the teachers and principals, they were there as well? Yes. So, <coughs> can I call on someone? Yeah. Go ahead, do you want to give? Yes. Yes. And just to let you know from Tolman, it was myself and Dean Lancelotti, and from Shea, it was Kathy Maynard and Paul Jennings. I think they're here, maybe not. Kathy's here. Um, so all of all four of us did agree that uh, letter C would be the best model. The reason being is one, we felt that the ninth grade should be a unit by itself, and the 10, 11, 12 should be together because there are some courses where 10, 11, and 12 are mixed. So we knew they had to be together because of the courses that they're taking. Um, we also felt A and B were just too scattered. It was too far apart. We wanted them to feel a little bit closer together. Um, I did bring up my concern about the tower was seven floors because our students have a difficult time getting through the building on getting to classes on time with three floors or four floors. So um, I believe you said that, you know, seven floors is just an option. They can knock it down to five floors. And then the entrance, I believe, to the tower was on the second floor. So, you know, having the baseball field there, having the football field there, we thought was wonderful because sports is such a huge aspect of Pawtucket. And now that we're that they're going to be together, we you know want to celebrate that. Perfect. Did that answer your question? Okay. The discussion. All right. Well, since uh, do you need anything from us at all, Chairwoman? Joanne, do you need anything from us tonight? This was just a presentation. Do you need anything else from us so we can? It would okay. be very right. helpful if you could. I'm, I'm, that, that's, I'm, why I'm asking, <laughs> that's why I'm asking the chairwoman to make I'm, a motion. I move that we um, 
we continue moving forward with uh, the tower version. Um, options, option C, thank you. With option C, um, and that's my motion. Second. Motion by Ms. Newby, seconded by Mr. Chavano to present or uh, go forward with option C, the tower, I would call it the tower. Pawtucket Tower. Pawtucket Tower. Pawtucket Tower design. Um, uh, do it. Discussion. Clerk, call the roll. Ms. Vanello. Yes. Ms. Carney. Yes. Mr. Chabano. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. Ms. Fernandez. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Shillow. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Everyone, thank, thank you, you for very, being very so much. decisive. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, next, next item, though, uh, school committee policies. First passage, Ms. Doobie. Okay. Um, the first policy we have here is our subcommittees of the school committee. This is here, um, it's not necessarily a change to how we're operating. It's just a change to wording that I thought was confusing. Um, maybe other people didn't find it confusing, but when I read it, I was confused and legal agreed. So <laughs> currently how we operate is, is the chair selects the, the chairperson, puts that person forward to the committee, the committee votes on it, and then that chair appoints the people to their committee. Um, and that's how our wellness committee is like kind of always kind of changing shapes and things like that. So that's how we've always operated. And this was intended to mean that with subject to approval by the, by the chairperson. But like I said, it's just confusing. Um, so I think it's clearer if it just says the subcommittee chairperson will be appointed by the committee chairperson subject to approval by the committee, period. Motion approved. Second. Any uh, discussion? Motion by Mr. Chauvin, uh, seconded by Ms. Grant. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Okay, first one. Ms. Uh, Doobie, second one. Okay, so our next two policies are completely new policies. Um, they are both policies that, are, that have been put into place because of um, holes in our policy manual. Um, the first one was brought to us by our transportation provider. Um, they were getting some pushback from parents who were saying, listen, I live right here, my kid, I know they're only in second grade, but can you just let them go? And they were saying, no, we can't just let them go. We need to see you. We need to see you to let your kid go. And they said, well, there's no policy saying that. Like the, they were getting pushback and without a policy, they felt that they couldn't move forward. So um, this was brought to us by our administration. We um, worked with um, our subcommittee, which is members here, as well as um, our union um, uh, president, uh, to figure out what we were currently doing and to put that into policy. So as you see here, this just clearly says that in grades PK to three, students are released when a supervising staff or bus monitor sees an authorized pickup person. That's the policy for PK to three. They need to see that person to release them. In grades four and five, sorry. Uh, in grades home independently, this should be communicated in writing to school and if applicable transportation provider. So it's not something that we're necessarily advertising to parents but parents can say you know my kid is going to walk home I'm putting it on paper you don't need to see me they can just go so that's just grades four and five um, and once again it needs to be in writing the transportation provider needs to have that writing to clearly say that and then grades six and higher students are released at the end of the day regardless of the supervising staff seeing a designated adult parents should discuss with their children what the arrangement will be for pickup and in addition the school and transportation provider will adhere to any transportation plan outlined in a child's IEP or 504 plan because that may specify that even if a kid is in seventh or eighth grade, um, yeah, that basically, okay, so that's the policy. It's a new policy. It is not changing current practice. It is articulating current practice so that it's clear, so it can be disseminated to parents so that they know it and so that, you know, parents aren't saying like, well, my kids really, you know, mature and they're in second grade, they should be able to just go, we can point them to this policy. So that's what this is for. Second. 
Motion by Ms. Pinola, second by Ms. Grant. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. And Ms. Doobie, finish us off with number So our three. last one is one that um, I, I regret that we have overlooked this one for a while. It was actually came by way of wellness, um, where a school nurse, um, Ms. Kathy Kando, uh, came to us and said, listen, we don't have a current policy on peanut, tree nut, and other food allergies. We have what we do, but we really need this to be a policy. So I worked with, um, with uh, Kathy Kando, and uh, she spoke with all the nurses to make sure that what was articulated was what was actually um, happening, which is that at the elementary school, there are clear procedures where students who are identified are placed in a peanut, tree nut free classroom. That classroom has signage and those students are notified. Um, and there's also a table in the cafeteria where those students can eat. At the secondary school though, because of all of the um, kind of ways that students move in between classes, that's not actually how it works. Um, I was really happy that I was able to speak with her because at first this just said this across the board. She said really at that level, the students that have identified that, they come up with a plan in coordination with the school and the family, and that's what's followed. So if a, if a student does need an accommodation, that action plan is just followed. It's an anaphylaxic, anaphylaxic action plan that's followed. In addition, our food service provider, Aramark, um, I consulted with them. They already said they have a policy, but we now have here that we need to make sure our food service provider, whoever they are, have a clear policy that they follow as well. So once again, this is not new practice. It is new policy. I have a motion. Motion, over. motion by Mr. Chabonneau, second by Ms. Connie. Uh, all those, uh, discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed? Aye, so I have it. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn by Ms. Benola, second by Ms. Grant. Um, clerk, uh, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? We're in adjournment.